Yep. Hi, everybody. This is uh, Donato Cabrera uh, for our first installment of Music Wise. Uh, we are so excited to have as our very first guest, my good friend Maria Redutu, all the way from Vienna, Austria. Hi, Maria. Hi. Um, there's so much to talk to talk about um, and subjects to chat with, but just let our audience know first of all um, a little bit about you, where where you're from. Um, maybe talk a little bit about what brought you to Vienna and why, and how old you were, and all of those fun things. Um, yeah, so I come originally from Romania. I'm a pianist. And I came to Austria when I was 13. I did the, um, the exam for the music university. And at that moment, I didn't know if I can. So I, I got accepted, but I didn't know if I am able to, to really come. And I had a huge luck to get uh, the only long time um, scholarship from the Romanian Academy, which made it possible for me to, to stay here. And to study, and then yeah, Vienna turned out to got, got to my to be my home. So so tell me, uh, did, was there someone you wanted to study with? Was there a con was there a personal connection with the, the, who you were studying with in in Bucharest with someone here in, in where you are now? What why why specifically Vienna, not Berlin or London or somewhere else? I had uh, four options because we, at that time in Romania, we didn't have internet or all the stuff that we have now. So it was really, I don't know, looking out for, for options. And um, it was Rome, Paris, um, London, and Vienna. And um, Italy was, the program was too easy. So we said, why there? Paris was too far away, and uh, in London I got accepted for a video uh, uh, by the Yehudi Menuhin um, Academy, mm -hmm. which was, I think at that time, 30,000 pounds a year. So impossible okay. for us. Mm -hmm. So it was Vienna. Cool. And did you know who you wanted to study with? Like, or was it, were someone just selected for you? Um, for the first two years, I was in the preparation part of the university, mm -hmm. and I was just lucky. I got three names, and we just choose by, yeah, I don't know. I And I, I really got lucky to have the, the best one for, for talented young uh, pianists. It was Imola Yo. Uh -huh. And then I got to, to know the professors here. So two years after, when I uh, got the, to the next great uh i choose to go to stefan blada aha uh -huh. so oh okay. wait so here's a question and we've talked about this before so you you came to, you 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 come to vienna new country did you understand any german at all did you study german what 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 was your relationship to the culture and language of austria when you first came when I came, I knew a little bit more, but a long time when I when I started studying music or learning music, and I, I was reading about uh, uh, musicians and the, the composers, and of course about Mozart. For a long time, I thought that the moment you get out in Vienna, you see their cars, they're mm -hmm. just horses, and so I had my image of Vienna was very uh, much the 18th century of Mozart. Right, right. right. And then, yeah, uh, so uh, this changed. <laughs> and of course, the, the connection that I had was, uh, connection, it's not, not even connection, but the I knew two CDs by really big pianists, um, not not talking about the Russian ones, mm -hmm. but from the, from the Western uh, parts, and it was Brendel and Polini. So you can imagine how, when I saw the name of Brendel on Concert House, so I was like, oh, I know him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is. It's you know, it's so interesting when you go to Vienna or you know, um, New York City or London, and you walk past uh, the Musikverein in Vienna or or uh, the Konzerthaus or Carnegie Hall, and you see the posters of yeah. people that that people are that are there every day. 
one day after the next. And you saw as a young person, Alfred Brendel, who at the time was still playing obviously a lot, hadn't retired yet. One of the greatest pianists that if you are an aficionado of, of classical music and classical music recordings, he, he recorded so many amazing, there's so many amazing recordings. And of course, Maurizio Pollini, one of the great Italian pianists who was also still is playing, but then was really at the, still at the right. very top of the, of the, of the piano pyramid. Um, so that must've been so like overwhelming in a good way for you coming to Vienna to be then surrounded in this, world that you only re only had access to via recordings or or the tv yeah yeah and also the recordings were at that time now it's not we cannot even imagine uh how far away it was now yeah. you get a, a flight ticket for 100 euros or something and now you don't because it's, everything is shut down but <laughs> But the distance between Romania and Vienna in, in the late 90s was a lot bigger. Uh -huh. yeah, I, know. I grew up with the Russian pianists, with the big ones and everything, but this, this uh, access to information was not, um, not as big as it was here already. Mm -hmm. so, but I had a, a teacher in Romania uh, and she studied in, in Germany. So through her, I had a little bit of access. And also I heard at her place, the Schubert and Promptus by Brendel and uh, and Chopin by Polini. So this was the only small door I I had, and the rest was from the music history, not uh -huh. not from the things that happened at that time. So I discovered all that when I when I came here. Um, so you ended up two years later studying with the, another great, very well known pianist, uh, Stefan Flada, and. Was this, do you feel looking back now, you know, you had a great education in, in Bucharest, you were learning uh, from a wonderful teacher, then you moved to Vienna. Was it all like you look back on the, your time when you were studying with, pian with pianists, was it all sort of a upward curve and like the right, the right teacher showed up at the right time in your development? Do you, do you know what I mean? Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, it does. Um... It's it's quite difficult to answer because I'm 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 really happy that I, I had a chance to study with him. Mm -hmm. But I changed a lot teachers when I was young, and then wow. I came to Vienna, and then I found him. And I was so happy that I stayed in his class for for a very long long time, and it was just nobody as for me as good as he was. Uh, so I studied with him eight years, and I think in a normal um, development or in a yeah general one. It's uh, children are studying along with the first teacher and mm -hmm. then they are changing a lot more. Yeah. But at the time that I was able to, I would have been able to change. Uh, I was in Vienna for six years and it was the first moment that I felt home because the first years were not so easy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I was from my personal point, I, I cannot change again. It, it took me six years to be home here. I cannot move to another country for for two other years, but he was always extremely open to to our communication, and so we changed for a while to chamber music. So oh. actually, I learned chamber music also from him. And after this while, then I got back to to solo. So he helped me in all these steps of development. What worse? What do you remember? Some of the things playing chamber music for the first time that was new to you that you hadn't experienced before playing just solo repertoire. What that was sort of a shock or a wonderful surprise. Uh, learning how to breathe together. Aha. Uh -huh. The beginning is I was fifteen when I did the first chamber music uh, rehearsals, and to understand that almost all the others need more time until the sound is here so it's not like on the piano it's here mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so learning to breathe with them and this was also the most astonishing part because um at first you learn it but at some point if you if you have an ensemble this um automatically breathing together it's the most beautiful thing on stage when you don't you don't have to talk about it and you don't have to take care of it it just 
it's, it just happens naturally. And of course, being a pianist, and this this is the same with any instrumentalist that that does not have to breathe in order to make sound, like uh, you know mm -hmm. someone who plays a string instrument or a percussionist. Um, of course, be, being a brass player or singer or a woodwind player, you have to breathe in order to make sound. But I, I would imagine that going back to playing solo repertoire after learning how to that you have to breathe in order to make music, it applies. It applies also when you play by yourself, more so than maybe you realized, yeah? That's exactly the point, that you can produce a sound, you don't have to breathe for it, but in order to make music, you have to breathe. Yeah. Because also because a lot of um, music is inspired by singing. Mm -hmm. so if you don't sing yourself, at least inside, you don't have to hear it, <laughs> uh, then the phrase won't be natural. You know, let's let's well. Actually, before we play the first video, I, I want to talk a little bit of, more about the idea of collaboration, of playing with a, a someone else, even if that person isn't a musician, because you now collaborate with uh, an, an incredible um, uh, dancer. Uh, he uh, is a dancer, uh, one of the main dancers at the Vienna State Ballet. Uh, Pesci. And can you tell tell us a little bit before we play this first video of this this incredible collaboration you have, how this idea formed, and um, what this what this what this uh, I, what this collaboration means now for you uh, with Inno? Mm -hmm. um, we worked together on the stage of the Vienna State Opera for a project where I was invited as a guest soloist. And um, most of the music was written by Mikael Carlson, the Swedish composer. Mm -hmm. And we had some scenes, just the two of us. So the whole thing was with videos and uh, dancing and choir and, uh, I mean, ballet, ballet choir and orchestra and a lot of things happening. But from time to time, it was just the, the male dancer and, and I, and that was also the ending. Mm -hmm. And it was for me the first time to work with dancers. Mm -hmm. um, and he was amazing because everybody tells you with ballet too too fast or too slow. You don't get anything else. <laughs> and if you're good, it's not not faster or not slower. And after the premiere, I knew that dancers are getting in the premiere a little bit slower and musicians a little bit faster. It's so <laughs> true. Yeah, because of of course everybody's a little bit nervous. And I asked him, was it fine? And was it too fast or whatever? And he's like, mm, not faster. And after the second time I asked, and he said, now I know the music so well, you just play and I go with you because you cannot look at me, but I can listen to you. Uh -huh. And that was the wow moment when I realized that he understands where we can help each other. Of course, I had my moments where I, I was taking care of him and he of me, but mm -hmm. it was this natural communication of how to do it so that every one of us is really um, free in, in his art. So, so based on that, we created the whole program mm -hmm. uh, and we always um, rehearse together. So when he do, does the choreographies, he, he's doing the choreographies on my interpretation of the pieces. So uh, we're going to play this video and at the sound, I, I will say, we'll see how this works. This is the first time. Tell us a little bit about the first thing we're going to watch, which is called Nini for Piano and Dance. That's originally a piece for a world music singer and her band. And I love this piece so much. And the composer wrote me another piece for my next uh, album. Mm -hmm. And I, I told him, I got on his nerves with Nini. Yeah. So that one day he came with the, with the score and like, that's your Nini. So he wrote, uh, he rewrote it for piano solo. And the composer's name is Marco Anau. Marco Anau, exactly. Yeah. He's an Austrian composer composing a lot of world music. And I was so happy and, and Enno also liked it. So yeah, Nini is kind of um, letting someone go. Okay, so here it is. I apologize in advance if the sound isn't a thousand percent, but it'll be good enough. I'm convinced. I got to put it back to zero. And 
I'll share the screen. Voila. And here we are. Thank you. 
Okay. Beautiful. That was such, it's such an amazing piece. Um, so you've now worked for, and so I need to ask, we need to uh, answer one question without giving away your age. How long have you been playing piano? Uh, long. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question. So we didn't, yeah. we, it's always so interesting to me because um, your, I, your mother isn't a musician, right? No. So was there a lot of music in the household or was this something you heard from someone else? What, why piano and, and when you were a child? Well, what happened? She was listening to a, to a lot of, mu of music, but um, I, she was trying with both her children, um, almost everything. So I started with dancing. I started, uh, I did some uh, painting classes, which were really bad. Um, and I ended, I was in a, in a, a preparation group for children mm -hmm. and the teacher, uh, my, my mother was a sports teacher. She, she went to her school and she said, I cannot promise anything, but she, here she has a good, um, pitch. She hears good. You should buy a piano. So mm -hmm. my mom was shocked, but, uh, we were living in this communist, um, buildings mm -hmm. yeah uh with a lot of musicians from the national um, um broadcast radio so everybody gathered up and they found a, a cheap but good pianino and the best uh, beginners teacher the best school so this is how i started with piano and i think just uh, after one and a half or two years for for, uh, for the first exam uh my mother realized that it turned out I was good, so I continued. And then, yeah, the whole Eastern European thing started with competitions and classes and, and everything. Um, did you ever have an, a desire when you were really young to play another instrument? Like you liked piano, but did you see someone play a violin? Like, oh, I'd love to play violin too. I desperately wanted to play something else when I was 10, mm -hmm. but it was not a special thing, but it was something else because then I realized uh, when we start, when I was 10, that the, the, we were uh, split up in the pianists and the people that are not good enough for orchestra are going to the choir. Mm -hmm. And otherwise I going to the orchestra and I said, I, I don't want to be with, I, I want to be in the orchestra because they play together. So this was the moment I realized as a pianist, you are a lot of time alone which I didn't want, but um, yeah, I, it, I had too, too many competitions already once, so <laughs> everyone oh, you would say to the piano. But of course, of course, you actually have, uh, you know, they're not for every piece in the orchestra, or not for every composition written for orchestra, but of course, beginning in the 20th century, especially the piano is a very important, instrument in the symphony orchestra and you have actually eventually even as a pianist and of course playing concertos you play with an orchestra which is yeah. wonderful but you eventually had the opportunity to play in an orchestra play the piano part in an orchestra yeah and that, and that must have been fine that must have been wonderful to have that experience eventually it was great because the first time i was playing piano in celesta uh on the uh, summer night concert from mm -hmm. the Vienna Philharmonic, John Williams, Star Wars. Amazing. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, there's another question uh, from Arabella. Do, do you memorize your pieces or do you bring your sheet music on the stage with you? This is actually a very good question because I just, I just want to give a backdrop to the idea of memorizing. It was not until, until um, Clara Schumann decided to play a concerto by memory. You know, was her, it was her concerto, no? It was, or was it her husband's piano concerto? Now I can't remember. I think it was her piano concerto. Um, that pianist, including Beethoven, Mozart, you name it, the, everyone before Clara Schumann played with the music in front of them. 
And then she decided in the, the middle part of the early, early part of the first third of the 19th century to play without music. And actually she was criticized for this. People thought that it was uh, vanity that she decided to do this. But it's so interesting now because uh, it's almost expected that a soloist walks on stage and usually plays a concerto without the music. So, but that's not always the case. So Maria, maybe you can talk a little bit about um, your approach, your philosophy about memorizing versus not memorizing. Um, I used to memorize and I played everything by heart until I think three or four years ago, mm -hmm. the 20th century stuff um, that we had to do in the, at, at the university. Um, and when I was young, I was um, seeing people the first uh, big pianist playing with this chord, like, come on, why? And why they're, because they know it. And at some point I realized that it, it's, it doesn't matter if you have the score or not. So everybody should do the way they feel best. And when I have, uh, I play with an iPad, mm -hmm. but of course I have to memorize it because you cannot read the music during the concert. So, yeah. Um, but I, I, the first time I did it, I felt a lot more conscious conscious about time, about the time that I I have on stage, and about ritatando. So it was, I felt a lot more free to to uh, to play with the tempo and to to feel also the audience. So I said, why not? If this makes me closer to the to the audience and clo closer to what is really happening now, because I'm not afraid that something can happen mm -hmm. with the score, then let's just put an iPad. That's fantastic. There's another question just came up um, from Diana Ichikawa. Did, did Maria help choreograph the dance? I, I think she, uh, I see that her connection is, 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 it's her connection is breaking up. No, of course not. It's yeah. all, all Eno, the wonderful. <laughs> Eno is a fantastic choreographer and he's doing all the choreography. Yeah. But um, there is a little connection between us because I, I choose a lot of music that mm -hmm. I thought it's it's uh, fitting. And then out of the music I choose, he chose the pieces that he's choreographing. And then yeah. I put in between. So we 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 build it uh, the um, program together. Mm -hmm. Have sometimes in rehearsal some moments of connections that are just happening, and then um, the also with Nini at the ending that we are going with the heads down. We didn't we didn't uh, choreograph it; it just happened, and we said, oh, "That's exactly the thing. How to end it?" So I, we are I, we're getting inspired. Yeah. I remember. Sorry to, to interrupt, but I was lucky enough, and I think we won't play this video, but. I, uh, because you have it listed, I feel so proud because <laughs> I, I, I took a video of you rehearsing um, and you were uh, at the very end, he sits of the piece that you were playing, the show, one of the Chopin preludes. Um, he ends the choreography sitting uh, sort of with you on the piano bench and you were discussing this final movement, whether or not you should look at him or not or become part of the, become a character of, yeah. in the dance rather than just playing piano. And I thought this was a very fascinating mm -hmm. moment uh, that I so expertly captured on video. <laughs> you were the first person to capture on video anything about piano and dance. Really? Yeah. So many, there's- we don't, before that. we don't have to talk about all the other firsts that I've been a part <laughs> of, but that's, I, I'm very proud of that. Um, okay, so now I'd like to play, what are we going to play next? Aha, okay. Um, this is from, uh, what do we have here? I wanted to play, ah, yeah, 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 okay. So next up we were going to do from, again, your your love for for collaboration. You, you started working with a couple of years ago this fantastic Viennese clarinetist, um, Marcus Adenberger, uh, and Marcus and you, put together this really uh, wonderful recording uh, called, and, and it's, it's especially for an American, I love this play on words, who, you know, an American who loves American music as well as Vienna, the Gersh Wien 
project, <laughs> Wien being the German title name for Vienna. And uh, aside from some uh, wonderful miniatures and so forth, and, and a great duo of Rhapsody in Blue, uh, you you wanted us to hear this recording of the two of you called Homage uh, Edith Piaf, the, uh, homage uh, to Edith Piaf. Um, That's the huh? That's the piano solo part. Ah, you, wait, is that what you want? Wait, okay, what about, you? do we want to do a duo instead? As you want. You can... I want to hear both of you playing. Uh, th then let's do the Penderecki. It's a uh -huh. fun... It's a fun thing to start a CD. So it's the very first track. Yeah. The three minutes. Okay. So we'll play. We'll play maybe the first two tracks. Okay. So let me go to that instead. And okay, we'll go to share screen, etc. Share, and then. Voilà. So had you ever played those pieces before? There's one more movement, which is wonderful as well, but had you ever played or even knew about those pieces by Penderecki? I knew about them, and but I didn't play them before. So it was the first time. Um, I have a question, you know, we weren't going, we, I don't, maybe you can share with everyone a, a link to this project, but um, it's been, it's wow, it's been over a year ago now, but when, of this refugee crisis especially hit, um, of course, Southern Europe first. And then as the refugees would start heading north, most of whom thought that Germany would be their loca eventual location. It, of course, everyone was coming, either landing in Spain, Italy, Greece, and then making their way or 
or via sort of the around around the Mediterranean. But eventually, so many of them would either end up in Austria or or come through Austria, and this was. A, 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 not only a, a political strain, which we in the United States heard a lot about, but it was actually a human condition where so many people who I'm sure like most of us, we don't want to leave where we live. And, and when we're forced to go somewhere, it creates such a traumatic event in our lives. I would imagine I've never had to be forced to go anywhere, but um, you created this amazing project uh, that I'd love for you to talk a little bit about. This is very, it's 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 very appropriate. Uh, it's very apropos, very appropriate to now because so many artists are in a situation where they where they need they're now forced to think about how they're going to connect to their audience because they can't leave where they're you know they're 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 at home. And yet, th and this is very similar in that you felt it was necessary to create a connection. Uh, not only with the refugees, but the, connecting the refugees to Vienna, Austrian life, to European life. Yeah. Yes, because um, in Austria, a lot of people really jumped and helped. Uh, not necessarily the NGOs uh, in the first place, but uh, really going to the to the train station and bringing food and uh, stuff for children. So the the civil population was very, uh, very welcoming at, at the beginning, mm -hmm. uh, at least. And then there was a point where um, they they were here for a couple of months, and I thought it's it's good to get all this help at the beginning, but it's important also to give something to be able to give something back. Mm -hmm. And that's why uh, we we build this um, this project where the um, Unaccompanied uh, young refugees were uh, taking workshops in uh, um, body percussion and singing and um, dancing. So it was everything that to do with your body and to put them on stage. So we had uh, concerts that were mixed between um, local artists and refugees. And a lot of what was important for me, a lot of friendships um, starting and they are still going even if the project is not as, as it was. Um, but this, I think it was good for them to, to go on stage, to bring something from their culture, to start talking to each other. And also in the workshops, we had Austrians and um, not Austrians living in, in, in Vienna and these young refugees. And when you talk to each other and you get to know each other, people are not, we were, Austrian population was afraid of the refugees. The refugees was, were afraid of the Austrian people. So if you manage to get them to talk, then a lot of beautiful things happen. And, you know, it's, uh, I'm curious, uh, this talk, this is, to, uh, this question is about the larger, larger topic of as an artist, you, every artist has, we all have great ideas, right? We all sit at home in the morning, we drink our coffee, and it's like, oh, I want to do this project. But it's one thing to be able to sit here with our coffee and our cigarette or whatever, or a glass of, our third glass of wine and dream big dreams, but it's another thing to actually make the project happen. Mm -hmm. And uh, can you talk a little bit about, of course, Austria is different from Germany. It's different to France. We all, we all have, and of course, the United States, we all have different, what we call funding mechanisms. Mm -hmm. um, how were you able to get the money, enable and support, financial support to make this project happen for you? Was this individual gifts? Was this applying for government subsidy, subsidies? How did this work? I tried to apply for for government supplies and state. I didn't get one euro, mm -hmm. uh, and I but I got one company uh, to to rent a concert hall in the in the Vienna Concert House and a lot of um, musicians to play for free. So uh, we did a big um, a s launching uh, concert. Mm -hmm. Uh, where we got a lot of uh, fundings also for the next months. So this was actually the base for the most of the whole project. 
So it was ju just really people seeing what we are doing and the first friends paying for the first concert hall and a lot of colleagues of mine saying from the first, I had nobody that said no. Everybody was like, yeah, of course I'm part of it. And that so, was so I guess the lesson is that if you, if you have an idea, don't be afraid to ask your friends to yes. help that help that idea come make be a be a re reality. Yeah, because they can say no if they don't want to. Of course, of course. we are always ask. <laughs> it's very good advice. Let's play another clip. I, I thought talk, let's talk a little bit about your album Juju. First of all, it's one of my favorite, it's like my, my favorite title of an album really? ever. <laughs> um, I love the title. Uh, and let's talk a little bit how this came to be because this was your first solo album, yeah? Yeah. Uh, I was very much afraid of microphones. Why? So I never, because you play the thing once and then it's there and then you have to face it how it sounds. <laughs> For the rest of your life. <laughs> <laughs> so I never imagined myself uh, recording CDs. Uh, and also, I never imagined myself talking on stage about the music I'm playing, and that's now exactly what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. um, but I had a um, concert series in a beautiful concert hall in, in Vienna, and I got to know Georg Burdicek, who's the most amazing sound engineer. And he, and he at the time, I guess, well, in the sound engineering world, uh, it's a very small world of people, but he, of is probably most famous for being the sound engineer for a very well-known Austrian label called Prizer Records. Would you say that's his most famous or no? Not only Prizer, he's, uh, he's at least in Austria, I think also in Germany, if, um, if a journalist doesn't know the, the musician and looks on the other side and sees Georg Budicek, you know it's going to be good. Wow, okay. Yeah. So, I didn't know all that stuff. And um, the, um, the concert hall was with this label, mm -hmm. in the same hall, and they said, come on, let's do a CD, and you have him here. I was like, I don't want because you have these micros. And, <laughs> but he recorded some of the concerts, and we had such a good connection. I said, ah, we can try. And he always, from the first recording, he always made me feel that he's doing nothing and that I have all the time in the world that I want. And he's doing everything. Amazing. So I started with him and I never stopped and he's definitely um, the sound engineer I'm doing everything with. Um, great, so, Len, so when, did, when did you record Juju and what track, we're going to listen to the Ligeti track, but yeah. uh, which is going to be wonderful, but uh, this was, uh, what, maybe it says. 2013. Aha, yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, when we played in Spain the first time, it was exactly after the first recording. Wow, 2013. It seems like a lifetime ago. Uh, so we're going to listen to a, a Ligeti piece. Now, these, these etudes are many, I would say for the longest time, most pianists felt that they were impossible to play. Um, and only a few pianists even attempted to learn them and perform them. Tell us about why you chose this, this challenge for yourself to learn a piece, one of these wonderful pieces by Ligeti. And how did you learn, how did you learn it? I had to because it fitted perfectly into my concept. <laughs> so the, the, the concept of the CD is that the middle piece uh, shows five composers mm -hmm. and the first one is Ravel and the last one is Ligeti. You can see on my homepage why and everything, but that's the short story. And Ravel and Bartok, uh, not Ligeti, but Bartok, and Ravel and Bartok lived at almost the same time and these two pieces are very different. Mm -hmm. So I took this living at the same time but being very different and I put it into romantic time uh, and I played the Chopin, but the very pittoresque uh, Chopin and a very existential list with Valet Doberman. And on the other side, after the last piece of the Bartok suite, I thought that uh, Schoenberg fits very well with his six little pieces. And the pendant, so the, uh, was Ligeti, this fanfare uh, etude. So I had no other choice but to learn it. <laughs> and <laughs> and, and you, can realize, you can learn it on the vertical 
way because the the harmonies are fitting extremely good and after you memorize it and you learn it you realize that it's quite jazzy and it can it, it's not it's not as technical as it seems at the beginning uh -huh. you can really have fun with it okay well let's 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 hear it this is uh the etude number four, the fanfare, fanfare's etude by Ligeti. And here's the sharing screen. And voila. It's, it's so funny because it's like your left hand is one half of the brain and your right hand is another half of the brain. That's and the problem with this piece. <laughs> it's just, it's like, you know, it's you're split in half. But it's so interesting because how you just described it before we listened to it, this idea of, think of it, thinking of it as jazzy, you know, sort mm -hmm. of like you're just sort of riffing with the with the melody in the right hand. It's, it's mixed, it's like fast, Thelonious Monk or something. It's, it's <laughs> fantastic. It's such a great piece. Um, 
let's before we be, I think what we're going to do is we're going to play the vi I'll, I will share the video of of the Mozart piano concerto number 23 because it'll be better sound that way everyone can watch it on their own and it's so wonderful we can talk a little bit about uh, we'll talk about this in a minute but it's the concerto that you uh, the reason why I wanted you as our first guest was because you made your uh, American United States debut with the Las Vegas Philharmonic and the California Symphony playing the Mozart's the Mozart's piano concerto number 23 um and now I have to remember this was 2006 17 I was going yeah. to say end of 2017 mm -hmm. um tell us talk, talk to us a little bit about what it's like first of all playing a playing a great concerto one of the greatest concertos for piano by Mozart um, by any composer, and what it's like to say visit a a, a new city for the first time, um, and and meeting an orchestra you've never met before. Of course, we knew each other going going in, but um, talk a little bit about that. Your your first experience is coming to the United States to play. Um, every time it's different because every orchestra it's it's yeah it's persons and individuals and that's. That's very beautiful. And I got so welcomed by both orchestras. And yeah, coming to the States, it, it was the first stop within Las, was in Las Vegas, which is different from everything else you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you know the story that I got so so late and then I wanted to to go for, to buy some fruits or something to eat and, and the, the the guy from the hotel, you, you cannot go outside. So it's the, you move all the time through the hotel. Why? You can't go out. <laughs> so, but then I saw downtown and 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 the concert hall and uh, yeah, and th then then it was San Francisco, which is for sure the what's what's the saying? Um, the the coldest the coldest oh. winter. Is Summer in San Francisco. Uh, yeah, the coldest winter I ever spent was a summer in San Francisco, yes. which yes. may or may not have been credited to Mark Twain. I'm going to believe it was. But anyway. Okay. Okay. Um, so yeah, it's it's four years ago. Three? Four years? Three. Yeah. Three years. Yeah. Three years ago. It was a beautiful experience, and I I, I was very happy to uh, to get to to know Sunshine and all the organizers, and and both orchestras were wonderful and very very supportive, and yeah, it felt like playing chamber music. Our our principal flute, um, Christina Cassiano, yeah. she just asks, uh, she still and so many people do remember your encore, which. Uh and and we can talk a little bit about because because Fazil Sai is such an important not only um composer uh, but he's an incredible pianist he just recorded he just released his complete uh, beethoven piano sonatas this year um he's sort of a musical force of nature unto mm -hmm. himself and um and so many people wanted to know what your encore was because maybe they may not have heard what you said da 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 da, da. Can you talk a little bit about this because it is a very special piece, and I'll, we'll try and provide a link to a performance of it some somewhere. Uh, it's called Black Earth, and yeah. it's one of his uh, most well-known pieces. Um, and I love it so much because it gives the the pianist a lot of freedom to play, also in the tempo and with the sounds. Every I, I heard a couple of people playing it, and everybody plays it very different. Every single one plays it very very differently. Mm -hmm. And and I like that a lot. And also this kind of a little bit world music and very down to earth. And um, I recorded it all, all, uh, already for, but it's not published yet because it's on my next solo album, Phoenix, which is coming in, in, in the fall. Yeah, and which will be exactly the thing that we need after this shutdown. Yeah. And yeah, but this I will be on Phoenix will be will be on the album. But tell tell us tell the people that maybe didn't see the this encore, you have to do something that more than just playing the notes on the keyboard. Yeah. You actually have to do something else that's not typical. Yeah, I have to uh 
to press my hand on the on the chords I'm using. So with the left hand, I go inside the piano. You press down on the strings. Yeah. And you can also make uh, a little bit also with the left hand because when you when you put your hand on the on the strings, it uh, sounds um, like a like a um, like a wood like a, a guitar. Ooh. Yeah. yeah. Guitar. Yeah. Uh huh. So I press it with the left hand and then I play with the right hand and it's it's very it sounds very uh, mystic. And it is that it's very captivating, very atmospheric piece. You have a lot of echo, and I played it in the in a in a church a couple of months ago, and it was the piece because <laughs> Im imagine a Gothic church in Vienna like this, and and the sound goes goes up. There's a question uh, from a student, a high school student uh, in Las Vegas from um, Las Vegas Academy, which is what it's called. Um, her her name's Arabella, and she asks. Uh, I, I currently uh, am a student in the piano program at LVA. Uh, I was wondering what I could do with my set of skills as a career option after I graduate from high school. Let, let me answer. Let me try and answer that question. So, I, I'm assuming that she wants to use her set of skills as a pianist. So, obviously, um, there's so many options. As going, when you graduate from high school, first of all, graduating from high school uh, will not give you many career options in any field unless you continue on and going to to university. But even if you don't pursue music in university um, as a major, I think that and Maria, you can add to this. I think that the and it's like in some ways it's very similar to learning to playing sport or, da or dancing when you're or when, when you're growing up um, learning how to be disciplined about something whether it's practicing an instrument every day or going to a football practice every day or whatever uh, writing every day drawing every day the idea of, of of accessing your brain and being disciplined about being creative because being creative and and being disciplined about being creative they have to go hand in hand you can be a creative person but if you don't be disciplined about it and do it with with intention it will never grow it's like it's like a muscle the creative the creative muscle and so even arabella if you go off to university and you study something other than music the skills that you learn practicing your piano every day will help in anything you choose to do. Maria, do you have anything to answer to that? Add? Uh, it's not about a piece of paper with the graduation, but I would always recommend it because it's it's about the preparation, not only to get to the graduation, but also to prepare the exam. I don't know how, how the exam is there, but in, in Vienna we had a lot of things to learn. Something that I would never play anymore, but this uh, range of of music that you have to learn and and try to to uh, to play convince convincing, yeah, uh, is very important as a base. And then afterwards, you can you can find your own way, but it's not. So the graduation is not to help your career, but it's for you to help build yourself. Mm -hmm. It's very true. Thanks, Arabella, for that. I have one more question from actually last week that I wanted to answer or to, uh, to, uh, to talk about. And we can both talk about this, even though it's just it's, it's about conducting per se, but you'll understand, Maria, when I uh, read it. Uh, when you plan, and this is from Martha Gardil, uh, when you plan each concert season, what criteria do you use when choosing composers and works for a concert? Um, Maria talked about this a little bit earlier about her recordings. Creating a, an album, creating a recording is a very similar to creating a, a concert from a conductor's point of view because you want it to have, it's not just random pieces. Of you know, I want to do Beethoven, then I want to do Chopin, then I want to do Ligeti, then I want to do, Mo to do Mozart. It's not about that. You want your album to tell a story beyond just the pieces you choose. And for me, 
um, when I when I program a season of works, it's based on a couple of things. First of all, I don't like to ever program something that the any orchestra has done within the last five years. That's my rule. It has to be five years, and then we can maybe repeat. Even then, I don't usually repeat something that was played six or seven years ago because there's so many great pieces that orchestras don't ever do that should be done. Or um, they're, of the famous pieces, there's still so many to choose from without having to repeat every five years. That's one criteria. That's not an artistic criteria. It's just sort of a, a framework that I set in my, it's a rule that I use. But when I, when I program a specific concert, my story, there are different things I, I can tell. I can tell a story about composers who are all living at the same time. Uh, maybe, uh, you know, uh, someone who was living in France and someone who was li living in Italy and someone who was living in Austria. And they were all composing these pieces within, the net, within two or three years of each other. I can use that as a goal. Um, I can choose one composer. So I often like to choose, a, I often like to do these sort of mini festivals where I do all Brahms, but I choose pieces by Brahms that are very different from one another, like the academic festival overture, and then maybe uh, a an, uh, uh, serenade, and then maybe uh, maybe one of the concertos. They, and they all sound so different, but they're all by the same composer. Um, or I uh, love to, uh, use a very musical um, uh, thing that maybe most people would never realize, maybe subconsciously do. I use music that are in um, keys that are related to each other. So maybe I do an overture in A major, and then the concerto is in D major. And then afterwards, the symphony is in G major. So what this does is the A, for those of you who love music, the A major is the dominant chord to the next piece, which is in D major. So that sets, the A major sets you up for the D major piece. And then you have intermission. And then that D major piece is the dominant chord for the G major piece. So you go five, five, five of five, five, one. And that's very, that's a very, um, <laughs> a very specific thing to do, but I tell you, people will, they may not realize what's happening, but it will sound like, ah, this piece should follow the, the, the previous piece. How about you, Maria? I have another one. It's okay. everything to write what you said. Yeah. Uh, I choose for, but I think this is more, more for albums. I uh, select pieces by their atmosphere to tell the story. So uh, that leads me to a little invitation for tomorrow to a digital concert uh, for my uh, last album, Insomnia, which is um, the story of uh, all the night atmospheres yet that you can have from uh, impressionistic. It can you have also a nightmare and the morning prayer and yeah, I think the link is somewhere. I don't know. I, I will. We'll, do we'll it. provide. We'll provide the link. It's on concertsal.at. So all of her do, Oliver's doing a great job providing links. You may not know that, but she, he's putting. Oh, them perfect! <laughs> Thank you. So <clears throat> for albums, I, I yeah, I choose pieces by atmosphere, atmosphere. So uh, sometimes when you see the program, you don't understand why this is related to each other. You get it when you when you listen to it. And if I don't have a piece for a certain atmosphere, then I talk to a composer to write it. And how? So, and tell me, tell me about that. How did that? Uh, how? What atmosphere did you want? And what? And who did you choose to write that atmosphere for you? I I wanted something uh, between Nordic minimalism, so between on insomnia, between uh, Peteris Vasks white scenery, mm -hmm. and. The last piece uh, where I wanted to have a morning prayer, which is a jazz ballad by an Austrian uh, jazz composer with a fantastic saxophonist. And for in between, I had nothing. So I asked Margareta Ferrer Petrich, mm -hmm. who is a very new music composer, but with 
a lot of heart inside her and and yeah she's also coming from balkan so she she was able to understand me what i wanted to say and she wrote last smoke mm -hmm. which is um about this moment of the last cigarette of the day or in the morning where you think you're alone and with your thoughts but there is something knocking behind so a ghost is still there it's like, uh, you cannot hide from me but the ending is a happy ending so if you have the link somewhere uh tomorrow we'll, we'll, put, we'll put the link with the link is going up also we'll provide a link to margareta's uh, uh website so people can hear her music as yeah. well um maria thank you so much for this i think for the first time this went well i hope everyone enjoyed it maria, and you know it's gosh it's already 11 11 p.m so it's time for <laughs> getting ready for bed for you. Um, let's do this again in the future. We can talk, yeah. we can find a time to talk about the new album when it's coming out. And um, thank you again. I really, really enjoyed it. And thanks for asking and have, yeah, you have a great day before. And you what I'll do now uh, is, uh, and I'm sure Las Vegas Philharmonic and California Symphony will do the same. We will share your performance of Mozart's Piano Concerto number 23, which is on YouTube. Uh, and uh, we can't wait to see you again in real, in, 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 in the flesh, as they say. Looking forward to seeing you too, very soon. Bye-bye. Thanks, Maria. Bye.